Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and today we're going to do a freezing point depression problem. Okay, let's talk about freezing point depression for just a brief moment. So when we talk about freezing point depression, the idea here is that freezing point depression is a colligative property. I have a little intro to colligative properties in a previous video, so if you want to go take a look at that, you certainly can. What the idea of freezing point depression is, is that when you add solute to a solvent, then the freezing point, uh, or the melting point conversely, is going to drop. Okay, so basically it's going to be lower than the original solvent's freezing point. And the way I usually conceptualize this is with uh, phase diagram, you can actually see that if you had solvent, uh, if you had solute and you had a pure solvent uh, kind of I going side by side with one another, it actually does drop. Several places have excellent graphics for that. I'm not going to talk about that too much right now, though. You can go take a look at those if you really need a little more information about the freezing point depression. What we're going to do today is we are just going to calculate some stuff. All right, so we have a problem. This is modified. I modified it quite a bit, but the idea came from ChemWiki, um, which is at ucdavis.edu. Fabulous website. Has a lot of very good chemistry. Has, in fact, a phase-ish diagram like I was talking about to show colligative properties. All right, so, you know, there you go. This one, um, if two grams of an unknown compound reduces the freezing point of 75 grams of water, to negative 1.32 degrees Celsius, then calculate the molar mass of the compound, assuming that the compound has the general formula MX3. Now, when we're looking at this, the reason why there's a separate sentence that says, assume the compound has the general formula MX3 is because that's important, okay? What we're assuming here is that M is referring to some kind of metal, X is referring to a halogen or some kind of non-metal, maybe in general speaking, excuse me, and that um, there are three of the non-metal and one of the metal. Now, when we talk about this, what this is a clear indication of is this is basically saying, hey, this is an electrolyte. And the fact that we're talking about a solution in water is important because if we have an electrolyte in water, we have to consider Van Hoff's factor, which means that our, our freezing point depression is always going to have this kind of idea, right, where the freezing point of the solution is always going to equal the freezing point of the pure solvent, that's what the dot means, minus the change in temperature of the freezing point, okay, but the important piece here is that when we, so it always has this kind of look about it, okay? But the important piece here is that this equation, the equation that describes what the change in temperature is going to be, is actually going to incorporate Van Hoff's factor, right? So there it has to have I times Kf times molality, okay? I here is Van Hoff's factor. I would assume that this is a strong electrolyte if I'm going to mention it, it probably is, and that I would simply count up the number of ions that that particular formula might split into. Now, experimentally talking, that's not actually what Van Hoff's factor is going to end up being because experimentally, especially if you have a lot of ions, it ends up being much smaller than you thought it would be. But this is just a round figure. All right, so. In terms of MX3, I would assume that this would split, if it was a strong electrolyte, into one, ma uh, one metal ion and three uh, non-metal ions, which means that that's a grand total of four. So we're going to label Van Hoff's factor as four, recognizing that this might not be exactly what the experimental moments are. Okay, And then we have Kf and delta Tf. First off, we need to find out what delta Tf is, right? So if we look at this, this is an algebraic equation. We need to plug and chug, figure out what we're doing. We know that the freezing point at the end was negative 1.32 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, I got out a little bit of room. This is actually that one. And that's equal to the pure 
solvents freezing point, which we know for water has to be 0 0.00 degrees Celsius minus delta Tf. Okay? So delta Tf here, if we split, switch places between those two, is going to be 1.32 degrees Celsius, right? Okay. So let's make a little line here so that you don't get confused as to what we're talking about. We found delta Tf. We need to now plug that into this formula. Now, what are we looking for in the end? We have all of these pieces of information. Well, we're looking for the molar mass of the compound. If we're looking for the molar mass of the compound, what we have so far is we have the mass of the compound. And if we give, a little, give ourselves a little moment here, molar mass has to equal mass over moles, right? So if I have the mass, that's fabulous. But to find the molar mass, I'm going to need moles. That's what I'm looking for. So if you look at all of these parts of this equation, the only part of this equation, the only variable in this equation that even has anything related to moles is molality, right? Molality is the number of moles of a solute, which is perfect because we're looking for this compound that's dissolved in water, over the number of kilograms of the solvent, right? So looking at this, I'm going to need to get moles of solute by themselves, which means I'm going to need to solve this first equation with delta Tf for molality. So let's do that. All right. If I want to solve for molality, it's already in the numerator. I just need to get rid of the i and the kf, which means that I'm going to do something like this. right? So molality is going to equal delta T, which is 1.32 degrees Celsius, divided by I, which we're going to count as 4 here. And then Kf was given. It's a constant. It's different de depending on what solvent you're talking about. But Waters is pretty easy to remember. It's 1.86. The molality of the solution then, if I use my handy dandy calculator, is point, let's see, 1.32 divided by 4 divided by 1 point, yeah, is 0 0.1774, which is way more significant figures than I need, but I'm going to go with it at the moment, OK? So that's all to get the molality. Now, we have to get molality. We know molality is moles per kilogram. We need to get kilograms of solvent. We need to get the moles by themselves. So let's erase this. We know how we got there. And let's actually erase. Actually, I'm going to keep the problem up there. Problem's important. Problem's important. Sometimes it feels like all I do is erase glass. <laughs> I like to write a lot on the glass. Kim Wiki has quite a nice site. They've worked very hard on it, those UC Davis folks. So thank you, UC Davis, for the ability to modify your excellent question. The one they have up there is a non-electrolyte. It's in benzene. Um, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, the one that's up there, but it's already worked out for you. So go look at it if you want to know how to do that one. All right. In terms of the molality, now that I have the molality here, I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to rewrite it so that I have 0.1774. I'm just keeping a lot of digits because I'll do my significant figure count at the end. That's moles of solute over kilograms here, and it has to be kilograms of water. So how am I going to get moles alone? All right, well, let's look at the problem, right? We should have some information that would help me here. So I have that we used 75 grams of water. Well, that's awesome. Look at this. Seven, if I just multiply this by 75 grams of water, then I'm really close right here to canceling these out, right? All that I need to do is a conversion between grams and kilograms. And you got to remember, that in one kilogram, and I'm putting this on the top in order to cancel it out with the bottom, there are 1,000 grams. 
right? So grams cancel out, kilograms cancel out. I get moles by themselves. Well, that was easy. Isn't that lovely when that happens? Times 75 divided by a thousand. And I got a number like 0 0.01. 3306 moles. Okay. Cool. That'll work. That's exactly what I wanted. So let's erase this. Recognizing that we still know that our molar mass has to be mass over moles. Now that I got the moles of this unknown compound, the only thing I have to do, the only thing remaining for me to do, is to put the mass over the moles. Sound like a plan? Because we know molar mass is the number of grams per one mole of the substance. Well, I'm going to hope it comes out to be some kind of reasonable number. It may not. <laughs> I kind of made this up off the top of my head while I was doing stuff. But it might be ridiculously light metals and non-metals. But, you know, we'll work with it. All right, so we said the molar mass is equal to mass over moles. So let's go ahead and do that. That's my last piece. I know I have 2.00 grams of this unknown compound and 0 0.013306 moles of this non unknown compound. Let's do my final calculation here. And lo and behold, eh, I got something pretty reasonable. I got 150. Point three zero grams per mole. Okay. If I were wanting to make sure I did the right number of significant figures, which at this point is not a, as big of a deal as you might think it is, but if you wanted to make sure you did, then you would have you would simply look at your beginning numbers, not including the constants, because those don't count. I have three significant figures here, I have four significant figures here, and I have three right there. That means that I probably should have three of my final answer. So we would just round this to 150 grams per mole. And that would be my final answer. All right. Excellent. Until I see you next time, this is the temperature uh, calculation for freezing point depression. Until we see each other next time, adieu.